Okay, so it's day 257, and uh, yesterday I saw almost nothing good in the news. Today I see almost nothing bad in the news. Even things that are, there's bad, but if you read between the lines, you'll see good in it. And I'll show you what I mean in a little bit. My basic thesis here, though, is that uh, first, I think this will be blue by Christmas. I think that uh, Herzan, this region, will collapse and unfold, and I'll show you why in one of the articles in just a little bit. We're going to start this with uh, the Institute for the Study of War their assessment yesterday, key Kremlin officials began collectively de-escalating their rhetoric regarding the use of nuclear weapons in early November. The Russian uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs released a statement that Russia is quote, strictly consistently guided by the postulate of the inadmissibility of nuclear war in which there can be no winners and in which much never be unleashed. Now, that's not stopping them from putting this in RT, but I think there's been a come to Jesus meeting behind the scenes. And here we're going to be talking about this uh, here and with this article a little bit later and this article a little bit later. So just stay tuned for more with that. Uh, Putin and the key Kremlin officials had increased their references to the use of nuclear weapons weapons from Putin's September 30th annexation speech through October, likely to pressure Ukraine into negotiations to reduce Western support for Kyiv. So it was kind of a bluff. And if that was a bluff and they're not actually going to do it, remember I said the threat is more powerful than the actual use. And I think uh, the bluff's been called again. The Kremlin's rhetorical shift indicates that senior Russian military commanders and elements of the Kremlin are likely to some extent aware of the massive cost for little operational gain. Let's say that you're Russia. You do use a nuke. The fallout, not just the nuclear fallout that is going to blow onto your territory, but the actual fallout that that you're going to become worse than North Korea as a pariah in the world is just tremendous. And what do you actually get out of it? Probably not much. The Ukrainians are going to continue fighting. So, okay, let's look at the next article. This is uh, Ministry of Defense, the, the daily intelligence update. On 3 November 2022, Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces, Valery Zeluni, stated that Russia had lost over twice the number of aircraft in Ukraine than in the Soviet-Afghan war. Okay, so we're into February to November, so a little more than half a year, three quarters of a year, something like three, let's say three quarters of a year, okay? And they lost twice the number of aircraft that the Russians lost in the Soviet conflict, Soviet-era conflict with Afghanistan in a decade. That is absolutely mind-bogglingly incredible. I just it's hard to even wrap your mind about it, around it. 278 lost aircraft compared to 119. Russia's continued lack of air superiority is likely exacerba exacerbated by poor training and loss of experienced crews. Now, that's really important because if you don't have trained pilots to do this, and it takes a while to get pilots trained, so it's not coming anytime soon, let alone to get new aircraft. This is unlikely to change in the next few months. Russia's aircraft losses are significantly outstripped their capacity to manufacture new airframes and the time required for training um, it further reduces Russia's ability to regenerate combat air capacity. Um, so I think this is amazing news, great news, um, because Russia has had a very tough time kind of coordinating air support, but it'll be less. Uh, and you'll see other things that are, be, that are lessened if you look between the lines. Okay, Russia's use of evacuated Herzon residents as human shields is a war crime. Okay, that they're doing this is terrible, but why are they doing this? Why are they using human shields uh, in Herzon? Getting them across the river? to get, I think they're smuggling their military across the river at the same time. That means that they're actually trying to get out of here, which is why I think this will be blue by Christmas. And I think that that's very good news. It means you have a whole different problem set, but the more territory that, they, that you actually withdraw from Russia's grasp, the better you are in, in the long run. Okay, next, uh, stable electric supply in Kyiv can be insured in a few weeks in the absence of new Russian attacks. Now, that's an important last clause in the absence of Russian attacks, but they suggest that within two weeks, they can have it stable, and within three to five weeks, they can have it back to normal, assuming that there's a, a lack of Russian attacks. Now, you can't just be like, I hope that they don't attack. That doesn't work, but what you can do is receive new NASM systems and other aircraft anti-aircraft missile systems, which they are getting. Now, this is from 
from Pravda, uh, right? And Pravda's even acknowledging these weapons will significantly strengthen the Ukrainian army and make the sky safer. Um, and uh, the United States has been supplying them. They like pointing it. It's the United States. They're the puppet master pulling the strings. Okay, so let, let's say that it is the United States. It is the United States as the, as the biggest of their big brothers from Europe and, and abroad that are trying to help them. Uh, but okay, and the United States has been supplying these weapons uh, since the beginning of the war in Ukraine. All right. Donetsk Railway Traffic Control Center completely destroyed. This is good news. Uh, now, so here's, this is again in Pravda, Pravda RU, uh, tra uh, Traffic Control Center located in the building of the administration of Donetsk Railways was completely destroyed. Why is that good news? Well, it's good news because the Russians actually are very efficient in using railway systems to get things to places uh, throughout uh, Russia and in Ukraine. And so to take away that ability is actually a very good step toward uh, reducing their uh, supply chain, reducing their ability to, to move uh, materials and men where it needs to go. Okay, next. Ukraine war is deepening Russia's ties with North Korea as well as Iran. And it sounds like, oh, that's a bad thing because these are two pariah states that you don't really want them to be mixing with, but that they are deepening with them. So if this headline was that it's deepening uh, connections with China and supplying weapons, I'd be like, ooh, that's not good. But it's not because China's not touching that. But North Korea and Iran, they really have nothing to lose. Russia's stature is gradually coming down to that of North Korea and Iran day by day as they continue to conduct this war. Uh, Russia's arms procure procurement from Iran and North Korea heralds an increasing convergence of military and diplomatic interests between Moscow and two countries regarded as international pariahs. Now, that's really interesting because that's The Guardian, which is UK press. And then here we have the same thing from Pravda. North Korea has all chances to become one of Russia's newest best friends. Like, that's not something that you should be rejoicing in. I mean, it's it's really kind of a bad thing. So uh, the first freight train in two years left North Korea for Russia. So they're renewing these ties because they need their arms. Uh, on Wednesday, Russia media also reported that railway traffic from North Korea and Russia has resumed. And so, yes, it's bad that they're getting these shells, but it's good to understand that they're reduced to North Korea and Syria. And I mean, like, who are your friends? Iran, Syria, uh, Belarus, and North Korea. And Nicaragua voted with you uh, before as well. I mean, that's it. So it's, it's really interesting to see this. Time to lift UN sanctions from North Korea? Question mark. Undoubtedly, it's time to lift sanctions against the DRPK. It hit, that time has come. <laughs> really? Okay. So, I mean, if you really think that this is great news, uh, if, if that's what you think, I'm tickled pink that that's what you actually think. Okay. Uh, U.S. reportedly, and I talked about this earlier, U.S. reportedly held talks with Russia on nuclear risk in Ukraine. And so this was just a little bit ago. And so the rhetoric has started to come back down. It got really uh, sky high there for about a month. And then it's it started to reduce. Now, it's not going to reduce necessarily in RT and Pravda, but it has reduced from the Kremlin. And that's really good news. Here's another article. Uh, the Kremlin refuses to comment about the U.S. report about undisclosed talks with Washington. Look, that they're talking is a good thing. I want them to keep talking. I want that communication. I want them to know, particularly if you use nukes, very bad things are going to happen. And it's going to be far worse than you imagine bad things that are going to, going to happen. And I want them to, to hold that line. Closing off communication almost never does any anybody any good. The Kremlin has refused to comment on the U.S. News and World Report uh, that Washington has held und undisclosed uh, talks with Russia um, amid fears that they could further escalate with nuclear weapons. Okay, but I think just that they're talking, I think, is a great thing. Now, this article absolutely baffled me. Putin wants to talk to mobilized citizens to find out if they get paid properly. Now, just think, if Biden wanted to talk to an American soldier or American soldiers to find out, are you actually getting paid, rather than just find out through the proper channels if this was the case, we think something is very wrong with this, within the system. But again, they always in Pravda and RT and TASS are pointing to how Putin is actually taking the bull by the horns by doing these things that he should never be doing. Yesterday, it was that he was um, he was going to lead a class about um, or, or training about how to use nuclear weapons as a defense of something. 
what? He's going to school the generals about that? Like, is he all knowing? Um, and I will definitely meet with people. I will talk to them about this or order and hear them in order to have feedback, Putin said. Oh, gosh. So come on. So that they're having this as an article is, I find, very entertaining one and very uh, interesting about the mindset of people that are reading this as news. Um, okay, last one. Uh, here is Putin ally <laughs> Prigozhin admits interfering in U.S. elections. Now, it's not... It's not good news that he's interfering in elections, um, but it is good news in the sense that he's finally admitting it. So, like, they know that they're interfering. We know that they're interfering. They know that we know that they're interfering. So now they're at least admitting it. So it's out in the open. Gentlemen, we interfered. We are interfering and we will interfere. Pergozin, who has previously accused of influencing the outcome of elections across continents, said in a statement, uh, carefully, precisely, surgically, and the way we do it, the way we can. So at least he's coming out and being honest. So I got to give him points for that. Although, uh, again, this is, and he's been, Russia has been involved in informational war against the United States for a long, long time. Okay, so I hope that if you watched yesterday, you watched today, and then you're getting to see some of the bright side as well. So thank you for your time. Thank you for being the kind of person that cares about what's going on in the world, and especially in Ukraine.